Good morning, all. Good afternoon. Sorry, I'm actually on the West Coast. I'm thinking it's morning, but we have folks all over. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I hated to turn off that music in the middle. That was so fun, um, but I hope you enjoyed that. My name is Danielle Barnes, and I'm the CEO of Women Talk Design, and I'm really thrilled to have you here with us today for our Speaker Stories event. A quick note that I wanted to make is that we do have some live captioning for this event. So if you look at the top and see that we're live streaming, that's really our captioning. So I'll drop that link um, in the chat as well so you have it, and you can follow along there. Uh, so our Speaker Stories event, this has been a series that we started um, over the past couple of months to really highlight the speakers in our community and share their stories about how they got started speaking, and uh, what they've learned along the way and what advice they have to share. And so each week we've featured a different speaker and I am so thrilled to have Nadia with us here today. I'm gonna introduce her in just a second, but I wanted to share a quick bit about our format. So um, in the beginning, I have some questions to get us started about Nadia's journey. And then we really wanna open it up to you and hear what you are curious about and what you wanna know. So about halfway through, we'll open it up for Q&A. And I encourage you to think about, you know, what are the questions you have? What do you wanna know about Nadia's speaking journey? What advice are you looking for? Uh, we'll have a chance to do that. You can either write your answer in the chat or you can unmute and, and ask Nadia directly. And then I encourage you to stick around for the last 15 minutes if you can. This is always a really fun part of these events um, where folks who are here have the opportunity to meet one another. Um, so we have some prompts to get you started so that you can, you know, have have something to talk about when you first meet um, that gives you a chance to meet other folks who are interested in this topic too and share where you are in your journey um, and you know what what it is that you got from today. So I hope you'll stick around. So without further ado, I'm very, very excited to introduce you to Nadia Bremer, who is a graduated astronomer turned data scientist turned data visualization designer. And after working at a consultancy and fintech company where she discovered her passion for the visualization of data, she is now working as a freelance data viz designer under the name Visual Cinnamon. And as 2017's Best Individual and in Information is Beautiful Awards, she focuses on uniquely crafted interactive data visualizations that both engage and enlighten its audience. Ranging from companies as extensive as Google News Lab to small startups, from printed magazines such as Scientific American to interactive experiences for The Guardian to more promotionally focused artful visualizations for press releases, data-driven reports, and data art for the office, as long as there's data that has a story to reveal. As long as there's data, there is a story to reveal. And when she's not creating visualizations, she can often be found somewhere outside the Netherlands, speaking at conferences, and making more people enthusiastic about the wonders of visualizing data. So please help me welcome Nadia. Thank you. <laughs> So thrilled to have you here, Nadia. So I'd love to get started. Oh, I spot the wrong video. All right, we want to see you, not me. <laughs> I'd love to get started. Um, we're going to talk a lot about your journey, but I want to hear a bit right now, or what are some of the topics that you're speaking on and um, why is that important to you? So I, f I find that one way or another, which presentation I'm making, it is somehow related to um, creating better data visualizations and that it's usually part that I want to teach people practical lessons, but I also want to inspire them. Uh, and that's mostly because a lot of people that do things with data visualization, but are, are not necessarily in the field. Um, they only think like Excel charts is what data visualization is. And there's nothing really beyond that. Um, maybe like a graphic designer puts it a little bit more, makes it a little bit more beautiful, but that's where it ends. So that's, I really want to um, show people that there's so much more possible in, in terms of data visualization and ways to visualize data and how to, how to go and think about that. Um, but also a kind of to show that these steps don't have to be very difficult. It's really just about taking the time to properly do a data visualization and don't just kind of go for straight for the chart button. So it's, it, that's always sort of the red thread, just like, how do you make better data visualizations? <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. And so let's talk a little bit about your journey and how you got there. Um, I want to hear, we can get started, I guess, where, where everything started. How did you start public speaking? Um, and what was that first experience like? Yeah, so um, that my first experience was in 2016. I mean, I've had to do 
presentations at, at, at school and university and maybe, you know, sometimes at work and I always hated doing those. Um, and then I, uh, I found, I kind of found my passion uh, in data visualization. I, I was like an astronomer first and then a data scientist. And then I knew like data is my thing. And there was this one, um, there are not a lot of data viz conference, like specifically for data viz, but there was this one that was really sort of, um, popular and big and all, all the big names were going there, uh, called open viz. And they generally have a call for speakers. Um, so it, 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 like you, you don't have to have, you know, you don't have to be a name in the conference world to be invited. Like you could send in an idea. And I was just thinking like, oh, I'm very new to this field and I don't know. And, you know, can I even, I, I posted some things online already and kind of tried to, try to bond with people. And then one of the people happened to be, um, a part of the committee. Uh, and she just sent me an email it's like, hey, why don't you apply? And that, that kind of pushed me over the, the edge. It's like, okay, I'm just going to apply and see where it goes. And the reason why I wanted to apply is because if you get picked as a speaker, um, you get uh, a free ticket to the conference, you get flown over there and you get a hotel. So <laughs> that was basically like, I need, the, I need that financial support to actually go to the conference. And I really want to go to the conference. And apparently by being a speaker would be a way for me to go to that conference. So that's when I decided to, to apply. And then, you know, luckily I was, uh, I was chosen. And then like the stress part began of realizing that you need to present in a room full of 300, 400 people that you like a lot of them you look up to because I was so new and I knew these names and these names had never heard of me. And that made it very stressful um, to even think about and, and, uh, and do it. So I spent, I don't think I've ever spent more time on creating a presentation than, than that one and, and practicing it uh, in front of my colleagues. I, uh, I'm a freelancer now, but I used to work in a company still back then. So I did practice rounds there. Um, but that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of how that started. And the experience itself, um, I was, I was so nervous beforehand. I was so nervous that I was like, I was feeling nauseous and I, I couldn't, I wasn't able to sleep the two days before really just thinking about it. And I was practicing every free moment that I got, I would do the, I would do the thing again. So I basically just knew it from the top of my head. Um, and, uh, but when I finally got there and uh, in front of the audience, the, um, uh, it, it turned out, it turned out all right. I was, I, I just like, I could, I knew it so well from the top of my head that I didn't even really have to think about it anymore. And I could really just kind of do it, but without being a robot, it wasn't like, just say like, because I knew exactly what I wanted to say. I could, I could use my brain power to emphasize certain things in the words that I wanted to say and these things. So eventually that was, um, it, it went pretty well. And afterwards, it was such an adrenaline rush of having done that and having people applaud for you and having especially coming up to you afterwards to talk to you. And that was so amazing that I kind of got addicted to the idea of like, oh, this, this, this speaking thing is really, really cool. And I really want to do it more often. It's fantastic. I'm glad even you, you just went for it. And like, even with those fears, we're, you know, able to present and, and do well and feel really good about it afterwards. Uh, so I'd love to go ahead. No, there's one thing that I skipped here because I wanted to sort of point it out specifically is that um, one of my colleagues at the, at the company that I worked for then, she also had really big anxiety um, for different things like getting her uh, driver's license. And she said that I should take uh, a beta blocker pill and uh, that would really sort of calm her down, uh, which I did. And um, Strangely enough, I was, I was like, like I said, super nervous, like on the, on the verge of nauseousness uh, beforehand. But um, because previously, once I, I got in front of a, a group of people, I still have that, by the way, if I suddenly have to sort of introduce myself, um, my voice starts to shiver really badly and I forget to breathe. Uh, so I might just say something and at the end, I'm, I don't have any breath anymore left. So I kind of had to take a really long break to get back at on my breath and that's not a, a not a really good presentation style but with the the beta blocker pill which is just a small thing that people sometimes take for tests or i i, I don't even quite know ex what the other things there are that it does but it just changed all of that i didn't have the tremble anymore in my voice and i could i didn't have this weird thing where i forgot how to breathe and just 
those two differences also made a really big confidence boost in in just being um you know not being so afraid to stand in front of a group of people so um i know that's maybe that's i don't know if that's seen as cheating but for me it's and maybe it's a placebo i don't think it is but for me it's made all the difference as well I think everyone has different things that work for them. There's, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's any like uh, endurance, endurance test uh, before you have to go speaking. So I think that's great. And it's, it's really interesting to hear how different folks um, deal with that, those nerves and, and how to calm yourself down. Um, so I'm curious how, you know, things have evolved since then. So I know that you've spoken at many events since that first one. And I'd love to first hear about how maybe your process has changed, if at all, for preparing for those talks. Because I know you mentioned for this first one, you probably prepared more than you ever have. And so how has that process changed over time? And how do you approach preparing for your presentations now? Um, I, a few things have changed, but I guess the basics kind of stay the same where I'm, I'm the kind of person that really, um, I spend a lot of time to prepare my talks with the interactive parts. So it's not, I don't, I don't create like keynote slides. I create like websites where there's interactive things going on and you can kind of, the slides uh, are just different websites. So they take me about a month and a half and two months in preparation to program it all. Uh, so in that sense, I'm not somebody that can easily switch things around in my slides. I can just basically turn them on or turn them off. Um, so, it, uh, but that kind of fits my style where I uh, write out the script beforehand uh, about what I want to say exactly with which slide. And then I, sp I spend hours and hours and hours practicing it until I feel like I really like the idea of that, you know, uh, this, this thing that I read once about a happy birthday, you can sort of jump in any point uh, when you hear happy birthday. And I have the same thing with, um, like with my talks. I know at any point, uh, I know at, at, in any slide kind of what I want to say, maybe not like verbatim, verbatim, but uh, pretty close. Uh, I get to that point and then I feel super comfortable with it from like when I'm not standing in front of a lot of people. Um, and then once I start doing it, I, uh, again, because I know, like, I know, I know that I will know my lines when I'm finally on stage. Um, and I really like that approach, like how, how it made me feel confident about being able to be able to up there and not have a blackout. So I've kept that part of uh, pre preparing my talks basically. Um, and, in terms of slide preparation, um, I may, I, I'm not making them as interactive as I did that first one. That took a lot of time and I also implemented things that I never uh, used in the end. So I learned from that. So I'm trying to find a good balance between where like the slides are where it really matters and I really wanna uh, put in my time to, um, to create them and prepare them. And the other slides is more images. So I just like taken down the number of hours I spend on creating the slides. Uh, so I can hopefully make more presentations uh, instead of just one big one. I really have to use that one for a really long time before I have the, the, the like the how you say that the the enthusiasm again to do that uh, another time in my in my evening hours. Um, and how I I plan out my slides is um, I guess I, I come up with the the basic idea of like what do I want to tell, and then I try and think of examples that might sort of like what's the beginning, where the examples, what would the end be. And then I have a little um, notebook where I draw out my slides. So I, I'll have like this, these small notebooks and this one over there. Uh, I draw out a few rectangles and then I start filling in, like drawing in what I would do on that slide. Sometimes it's only words, sometimes it's like small images or like, like explaining animations that I might wanna do. And that's something that I started doing in the, uh, I guess in the second, my second presentation. And that's also been very valuable in again, saving time on, actually building out the slides eventually. I love that idea of sketching everything out first and you can see it and it's like your little prototype before you yeah. you go and make it live. That's great. Um, and so it sounds like, you know, your, your process has evolved a bit over time. Um, and I'm also curious about you know, where you've gone about finding your speaking engagements. Cause you, you mentioned the first one that you gave was within data visualization and that's what you were doing and that's what you've ex been excited about, but you haven't only spoken at data visualization conferences. And so how have you thought about, you know, where you speak? Do you apply for conferences? Do folks reach out to you? Um, if folks are reaching out, how do you make that decision of whether or not to say yes? Just anything you can share on that. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so at the uh, when I started in 2016, um, I applied for several conferences. Um, for example, there was one in Australia that seemed really cool to be able to go there. And uh, so I applied for that one. Uh, and there was, uh, again, sometimes with the idea of like, oh, if I if I do get in, it's really fun to, to be able to get that extra experience, that sort of um, um, exposure that you get and then um, uh, get, being able to go there. Uh, but after that, actually, after I, I especially I did the um, the the DataViz conference one. There, once the video came out, um, several other conferences somehow I, I I tweeted about it. And at the time in 2016, I I also shared these slides and like the actual presentation itself. I shared it online, and that that kind of that got so many tweets, especially for like. Uh, how, how small I was back then that was so many tweets were going on and then suddenly a few conferences emailed me asking like hey do you uh, do you maybe want to um, come uh, and and present at our at our conference uh, I also what that was the sort of a serendipitous moment where um, one of the front end um, meetup groups in the Netherlands was going to a database agency and so I thought well I'll go there so I went there and at that meetup, I met somebody else who had seen that tweet um, and knew that I had done this talk. And he's like, well, this meetup also organizes a big yearly conference. And I think you should, you should speak there. So he just dragged me along to the conference committee because he was a previous conference organizer for them from previous years. And he said, you should get her. And then kind of the ball started rolling from there. I just sent them my link to my talk. And they're like, yes, please, could we please present at our conference as well. Uh, and that kind of got me into the web design conferences because I spoke there and again the image the video came out uh, and then I got asked more by other web design conferences and, and front end conferences as being I guess I'm kind of like the the odd one out that does something on the web but not very much not in the field that people would normally see as very much front end and, and JavaScript and CSS I'm like this weird outside thingy that could be fun as like a, as an intermezzo, like look at inspirational database, that would be fun as a, as a way to break up the program. Uh, but that, that's kind of how that grew. And these days, um, I don't apply also because I want to give other people again the, the chance to apply at these conferences. And then now that I'm freelancing and, and, and like things have been going well for me. And I, so I feel like I don't want to take up that spot for, for newcomers and I'll, I'll just go to the conference and be an attendee and don't have to stress myself. Um, but the conference that, that reached out to me still fill up um, a lot of my uh, agenda. Like I, um, and then figuring out where to, like, which do I say yes to, which, uh, which not now also has to do with if they offer, um, uh, like what, what do they reimburse? If they don't reimburse at least the flight the, and the ticket and the hotel for a few days, then I, I'm usually not coming over except if I really wanna go to the conference myself. Uh, but that's also because as a freelancer now, I don't have support of a company that would keep paying me for the days that I don't work or might actually pay for my flight. It all comes from my own cost. So if they if they basically want to have me over um, to speak, they should kind of, you know, um, make sure that it doesn't like like the flight in the hotel doesn't cost me money. But I also ask for a speaking fee. And that is definitely not enough to sort of offset the number of hours that I might and uh, when I'm that I'm not able to work on clients because I'm traveling abroad and being at the conference but it's more of a I guess of a a mindset as well by the conference that they um, that they acknowledge that without the speakers there is no conference so you need to kind of show this to your speakers and not assume that they will just be there to kind of to speak so that's why I also ask for uh, kind of for a speaking fee if they don't do that and for me Again, they need to have a good reason why they don't offer a speaking fee. Like if they're a, like if they want to make money, they definitely should have a speaker fee. If they're more community run, then I'm like then I might say like okay, I'm okay with not a speaking fee. But um, so it's it kind of depends on how much I like their conference, how they are approaching me, and how their kind of like their mindset of conferences. 
It's helpful too to hear how that has really evolved in your mind um, from when you were first starting out and like this is brand new and you just wanted to attend the conferences to really thinking about, okay, well, how do I balance all of this and how do I make sure that events are respecting me and my time and other speakers? So that's great. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I do want to encourage y'all to start sharing in the chat what questions you have. Um, so if you, you have a question for Nadia that you want to ask, please drop that in the chat. I'll also pause in a couple minutes if you want to speak up, um, but we'd love to start seeing those questions. So you talked about how um, much time goes into this and one of the reasons why you can't say yes to everything now, but you still, you know, over the years and, and currently are, are speaking a lot. And so I'm curious, how do you balance that with your career? So I know previously full-time job, now freelancing, how do you balance that time? And have you seen benefits in your career um, from speaking? Yes. Uh, so I can definitely say yes to the latter part where I've, um, uh, I've seen the benefits, not only just, to, it's not usually like the, the decision makers that are in the room, but they, I feel like there's like, there's a one step in between that people reaching out to me to do client work for them. Now they, uh, they might say, Oh, my, um, uh, my like, uh, co-worker or my employee has seen you speak here and so he pointed me towards your website and it looks like you can do what we what we're looking for so in that sense um, it has definitely helped me get some client work and again some sort of um, references from people that have seen me speak and kind of know of her have seen the type of work that I do and that that it fits with them um, and uh, it's um, oh god now I forgot the first part of your question because I immediately dove into the second part. It's just about balancing your time and how oh, right. you fit it, it with everything else. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's more hard when you have two part questions anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, balancing it. Yes. So um, I'm, in my first year, I basically kind of accepted everything because I was so enthusiastic and was like, yes, 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 please. Um, and then I saw that my client work was really suffering, uh, suffering from that. Um, and that's when I decided to kind of have a maximum number of conferences that I might have in, in, a, in a month or in a three month period. Uh, and then I might only make a very like exception for if I, if that specific conference might reach out to me, then I would definitely go there still, but otherwise I'll stick with these, uh, these few. So it's really, I try and, and do maybe uh, like two, like before, before the pandemic, uh, I would do maybe um, two ver like far away international conferences. If they like, if I had less, that's fine too, but no more than two in like the spring and then in the fall period. Uh, and then local ones, maybe a few more. And it's, if it's in the Netherlands, then it's like no, no issue at all uh, because that's so little time that I'm away. Uh, that's kind of how just, you know, no, uh, a maximum number of conferences in, in, in each of these sort of time periods. Awesome, that's great. All right, folks, we wanna hear from you. What questions do you have? You can unmute and share or you can drop it in the chat. I have questions I can keep asking. I just want to give everyone a chance to ask their own. So I'll, I'll ask this one as folks are thinking about what questions they want to ask. Um, I know you were talking about how much time goes into creating a presentation and you know not wanting it to take up too much time so that it's the only thing that you present um, and wanting to present you know other talks. But I imagine you present the same talk multiple times. And I'm curious how you think about um, when to keep giving the same talk versus when it's time to create and build a new talk. I find that one tricky. I haven't quite figured that out as well. And, and yes, so I do give the same talk multiple times because it takes so much time. So it wouldn't really, uh, it wouldn't be, be viable at all to make a new talk, um, at least the way that I work for um, every conference. And I generally try and use a talk for, I think about a year and then see if I can come up with, um, with a new one. And, but also has to do with when do I feel like I've had, um, I have enough new material to create a new talk about, or do I have a new idea uh, to create a new talk? Uh, so for example, for the very first talk that I gave at the data sketches conference was slightly, it was kind of technical towards data visualization. So when uh, I got the introduction to do the, um, the front end conference in the Netherlands, I knew that that wasn't a good fit so I even if it even though it was only three months later I, I built a completely new talk that was more um, focused on, like more geared towards uh, front end in general um, and even more just um, it, you didn't have to know a lot about database to to sort of enjoy that talk 
Uh, but uh, it's since that I, I'm trying to serve, sort of, yeah, one one a year. Uh, but I sometimes use uh, older talks at conferences these days. So it, I also look at the the type of conference and the type of audience and what they might be looking for to see what which one of my talks would be the best fit. Uh, and I have sort of like my oldest talks. I kind of I I still have them there but i like only in very rare occasions might i now say but maybe if i feel that the the visualizations that i'm showing in that talk haven't been outdated by now then i'll try and sort of um see if any of those work better than my latest talk um relevant to to this but also like a little bit just wider about your overall um work it's all asked can you speak to your process of imagining and sketching your data visualizations they are very complex and beautiful to look at at the same time thanks um so i always start off with um understanding the goal that the client has or if it's a personal project like what is my interest in this particular topic uh, so i try and figure out what should people learn when they look at this visualization so once i kind of um uh, have articulated that that's like we can actually say that in a sentence uh, i then also want to understand the data so what variables do i have in my data set um, uh, what would be the most important variables what which variables are kind of nice to have to maybe tweak the visualization with a little bit and with those two sort of ingredients, the goal and then the data and understanding a little bit about the data, I, I go into the sketching phase. I always do this very um, rough. So just uh, basically a piece of paper and a pen or an iPad Pro kind of just like, but by hand. And I, um, I try and think of ways of, okay, with this data, am I, should I make that in connections? So maybe with the lines connecting two entities or uh, is it more uh, to like, should I put it all in the circle? How do I want to do I need to show flows? It's, so it's very on the abstract idea. I want to figure out how I'm going from numbers to visual encodings. Uh, so I don't think about layout and, and colors and the details. It's really about like the rough way of how I'm going to place my data on the screen. Um, and I also try and then uh, I generally create sort of a, a Pinterest mood board for these projects where if I have a like my rough idea kind of ready, I will look through some of my other curated Pinterest boards for inspiration and I put everything that kind of sticks into this sort of client mood board and then with that client mood board on my screen, I might uh, do like a second um, second attempt on the design and I might sketch some new ideas, maybe some deviations that I could try depending on however the data might behave itself. Uh, and then I discussed that with the client. So it's really just on, based on these rough sketches. Uh, we figure out a way to continue. And then I start immediately creating it with the, um, the actual data. So I see if the design actually works because that isn't always the case because uh, data is really stands and falls with the, with the data, not really with the design. Well, it's, it's a two, like it, it comes together. Um, and then from that, from that point on, it's, it's really designing with code. So that's when really the, the, uh, the visual appealing side needs to come in and I need to figure out what, wh which colors to use, how to make it look kind of pleasing and unique, but also still effective. And that's kind of all, that's all I, I that's endless iterations, endless. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and then Sarah wants to know, give a talk at a conference or take a freelance project, which one is more tiring? <laughs> um, so if the, if the, poof, I mean, if the talk is already done, then that's uh, then that's less tiring because like the actual creation of the talk and practicing the talk for the first time, so you I know it by heart, is more tiring than a client project. But once I've done that, giving a presentation, I feel is less tiring than um, than doing a freelance project. Great. And to follow up on, you were sharing a bit about your process for developing your visualizations. How do you decide which ones to share in your presentations when you're presenting and, and speaking? Um, I think it has to do with um, maybe there's a, a, um, a, like a theme that I have in mind. For example, my, my latest talk, which is actually a year old, so I should create a new one. But with the pandemic, I've just been postponing that. <laughs> Uh, but it's I, I, I noticed that a lot of my past projects and client projects were about connections and visualizing connections. So I thought, well, I, I guess I want to do a talk about visualizing connections. So I thought about the projects that would fit that and I chose uh, my favorite ones that I thought 
would have a good story to tell. Uh, because I, I generally like to show also the design process. So from like the ugly start to failures to eventually uh, the final result. Uh, so I think about which of those, like thinking back on the process, which of those had an interesting sort of design phase that it went through that I have, uh, I could tell something about. Uh, but in, yeah, in general, I guess that's, that's kind of the idea. Like which of the projects am I most proud of combined with, um, did something interesting kind of happen during the design phase or directions that I tried that I could kind of show and then to help people understand like how I go, how I go, how I go about my design process. Great. And um, we have a question from Irene. Uh, did you learn D3 or other no so common uh, visualization tools? And do you recommend any course so folks are also interested, not just in your speaking, but in, in your work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I do. Um, I do most everything with D3, which is a JavaScript library that has basically become the standard for data visualization on the web. Even if you use something else on the web, you like um, in many of those cases, there's like a like a D3 is somewhere under the hood. Um, it's uh, it had a steep learning curve. I didn't know any web languages before I started D3, so I was learning JavaScript, HTML, CSS together with D3. But the like the payoff was it was so cool to be able to create these interactive charts that it was it definitely kept me enthusiastic. Um, I am also kind of trying to learn WebGL for when the data sets get really big. So um, you need some more specialized tools, um, which is also again a steep learning curve, but I'm in the middle of it. And in terms of courses, actually for me, it was a book that really helped me. Um, so it's called Interactive Data Visual, like, hmm? Interactive Data Visualizations for the Web by Scott Murray. I, I really like that one because it assumes no knowledge of web languages. So it assumes that you don't know what HTML or CSS is. Um, and it really starts from there and helps you understand the, the mindset of D3 and programming together with HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So after that, I could kind of make my own interactive bar chart. And from that, I had a good jumping off point to continue and learn on my own. Uh, I also know that on front end masters, there is uh, there are several uh, uh, great workshops given by Shirley Wu, um, and she's she's also a D three master. So uh, uh, if you want to, if you like, if learning through like somebody teaching you is more your thing, I can definitely advise you to to look there. Great, awesome. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, I sent this over in a question in advance, um, is I'm curious if anything's ever gone wrong when you've been presenting. So um, <laughs> either before on stage or if you've been presenting at all during, uh, while we are all sheltering in place and, and doing that remotely, have you ever had a situation where something went wrong and, and how did you handle it? Um, I've had like, I, thankfully, I've only had minor things going wrong. So I could be on, on stage and sometimes the mic is just kind of wrong and it might be here and you can, I can hear myself breathing over, um, over the speakers. And I know it's annoying to me, so it must be annoying for people to listen to me breathing for 40 minutes. So I kind of, at some point I try to uh, move the mic away, but it's usually kind of fixed in place. And then I completely kind of, um, messed up the mic. So I was on stage and um, I thought everything was good because I couldn't quite hear the breathing anymore, but apparently more was wrong because suddenly a tech person just came off the stage and started fussing with my ear without kind of asking me anything, well, which is fine, but it was just kind of a, a comedic situation where I'm just talking and suddenly from the side, somebody gets to me and kind of starts plugging things in my ear and checking things. Uh, and uh, a little bit, thankfully, the, the crowd just had to kind of laugh and it was over a few seconds later, but it's really just that that's basically the worst thing that thankfully yeah. ever, ever, ever happened. I haven't fallen off a stage and um, I was, I was in uh, South Africa uh, once and um, there were blackouts. <laughs> so it, everything would just sort of go off. Like the screen would go off. Everything was off uh, every so often, but uh, thankfully during my talk that didn't happen but the one before me that happened the one after me that happened so even there I had a wow. I had a lucky streak <laughs> yeah what did those folks do when it went out when the lights went off or the power went off yeah well thankfully it was during the day so that was uh, the lights going off wasn't uh, and it was sort of in an uh, in a semi outside much uh, okay. much daylight coming in kind of room 
Um, but the, the missing slides was a bit of an issue because it wasn't just a few seconds, it was several minutes. So they kind of like, hey, you have to imagine now that I'm showing you blah, 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 blah. And then they kind of tried to continue their, continue their talks or might go into sort of a tangent of, oh, this is still something interesting I can tell you about until we wait until the, the power comes back on. But I'm happy I didn't have to figure out what I was going to say during a blackout. <laughs> yeah, I'm knocking on wood for you that uh, we're not jinxing you now by, by asking that. <laughs> um, and have you been doing talks online since a lot of conferences have moved online? And, and how has that experience been? What have you had to shift on your prep or how you present uh, presenting to a virtual audience? Uh, yes, uh, I've done several conferences um, uh, online and in, in the beginning it was a lot of, uh, I really had to get used to the sort of the un, uh, unpersonal nature basically that uh, you are just like there are people on the other side but you have no connection with them. You don't know if something that you say connects with them, maybe like you joke that you have, you don't know how that falls uh, because you have no, like nothing comes back from the audience. Um, that's also why I find it hard to right now come up with a new talk because I like I do kind of chafe my lines if I see how it um, how it works with the audience, which I don't have. So that was and then like once you're done, um, like you don't have that enthusiasm or that rush that comes from doing a talk on a stage just because of the nurse beforehand and and like the people applauding to you afterwards. It's just sort of this very cold, empty, I'm in my room, I'm, I'm presenting now and now I'm done. It doesn't, it doesn't nearly have the, the same kind of um, vibe or, oh, what's the English word again? The, um, I guess, gratification that you feel when you do it on stage. Uh, on, but I've gotten more used to that now. When things that I do forget still are looking in the camera and not looking at the screen. Um, and other things that are quite different from doing it on a stage is that several, um, uh, several conferences have asked me to do it pre-recorded. So they actually don't show me live doing it. But the benefit of that is, is that during, while I'm giving the presentation, like, I'm, like while the presentation is being played, um, I can answer chats, so um, questions in the chat. So my people like during the talk can post questions and because I'm like not occupied anyway, I can immediately start answering them. And that kind of lowers the barrier as well for people to ask questions because it can be kind of intimidating to sort of, you know, uh, speak up and be the one that is on the screen and everything. Uh, so that's had some kind of uh, um, positive reactions, which I think, yeah, it's, an inst it's like, it's a positive side effect of doing it all. Uh, all online. Yeah, that's great. Um, I know that you had mentioned you have, you know, will be making a new talk at some point in the future, aren't, aren't necessarily there yet, but I'm curious what do you have goals of kind of what's next for you or what's in the future for you when it comes to public speaking? Uh, um, there, oof, I don't, I don't necessarily have that big of a goals with public speaking. I guess for me, it's about um, in making in making sure that I uh, I find the fun in it and that it, it keeps being this rewarding experience that makes it worth it to travel to some uh, places, even uh, you know getting up early, having the stress, uh, preparing the talks. Uh, so long as that feels good, I'm I really would like to do it more and. There are definitely some conferences that I would love to um, uh, love to be able to speak at or or go to again. I it's yeah it's I don't have any specific sort of sort of goals. I, there are some rough ideas in my mind that I sometimes I write down an idea like maybe I could do a talk about this in the future uh, if I feel ready to to make a new talk again. But I do I do find it hard to figure out what I want to present about it because I'm not the person that has like big ideas. I don't, I'm not like, oh, the future of data is blah, blah, blah. This is what everything should be. I'm more like, hey, this is kind of cool. I want to share it with you because I think it's cool. Uh, this is how I do it. Maybe, maybe you can get something from it. Uh, but I'm afraid that I might get into a pattern where each of my talks are the same, but with different examples. I'm not sure if that's a bad thing. I don't know if it's a good thing, but we'll see. It's like, 
yeah, so no big goals, just just trying to keep it fun. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Um, and I have a more question and then we have one more in the chat. And then I hope that folks can stick around for a couple minutes of meeting one another and we'll go into breakout rooms. So um, my final question is um, just about the best advice that you've received or kind of picked up along the way when it comes to public speaking. So maybe something that you learned yourself from doing or someone shared with you. Um, what's a piece of advice that you'd want to share with everyone else? Um, so they were the two things. So one was actually the beta blocker pill that made a really big difference in, in me just being able to not like my body, not being in the way of me wanting to present. Um, but the other one was also what I mentioned before, where I saw, um, I came across a blog. So I guess not somebody personally didn't do that, but that showed these different styles of how you can uh, prepare a presentation where some people prefer to have like just basic talking points uh, and then each presentation will be will be quite different but like the general conclusions will be the same uh, and then seeing this idea there that, that it's also fine to be the person that uh, that knows it completely by heart and that um, that it's that it's fine that you don't necessarily have to be uh, sound like a robot if you actually know every line um, and that be I thought that was wrong and then I saw that it was like in this blog post, it said like, it's okay. So I went for it. And I, as I expected, it was completely my, my style. And I felt comfortable with that. So it's like, if you feel your way of doing like a talk is your way, go for that. I love that. I think that's such great advice. There's no one right way to do something, find what works for you. And then finally, Paula asked in the chat, what are some of the biggest challenges in data visualization today? <laughs> um, there is the one hand that um, how like how much can you assume your audience knows like what is the data literacy of your audience like the people these days know line charts and bar charts maybe but if you go beyond that um, so sometimes great ideas in terms of how to effectively make a data visualization are shot down because they are seen as our readers are not smart enough to be able to grasp this uh, so they will not understand it so it needs to be simpler that's that's one side that i find uh, that, it, that it's always hard to kind of struggle with the other side especially for web stuff is performance browser bugs these things even like with data visualizations it's a lot of data that needs to be loaded it needs to work at desktop screens and mobile screens can you, i mean can you imagine that i need to make a visual that kind of looks good on a big screen and then it also somehow still works once you look at it at a mobile screen i'm not using text or anything i'm using pixels so i'm the amount of pixels that i have is so severely reduced that it's uh, that it's not it's I wouldn't say it was fun to develop for mobile. It's fun to develop for desktop, and then mobile is like ah oh, shit, mobile. <laughs> I do I do spend my time on it, but it's the the less fun part of it all. Um, but again, these are maybe not like the biggest challenges. These are more my personal challenges. But um, things such as data literacy are more of a bigger challenge for the general group. Um. Well, thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you for sharing your story with public speaking, for sharing a bit about your work and sure. the advice that you've learned along the way. I want to give you a big round of applause. You get some feedback here, even if you don't normally um, when you're, when you're <laughs> doing a pre-recorded or, or can't see folks. Um, yeah. and, and thank you all of you for your questions as well. As I mentioned, we save the last couple minutes of our speaker stories event to give you all a chance to chat with one another. So I do hope you'll stick around. I'm going to open breakout rooms in just a minute. And and um, I'll drop some questions too in the chat that you can use to um, talk with one another to share a little bit about where you are in your speaker journey, um, where you might be able to use support or guidance, if there's anything that Nadia shared today that really resonated, and then you can talk about anything else, but you know, that's just some questions to get you started. Um, and if you're able to, when you break out, I encourage you to turn on your video to be able to say hello. I know that folks are joining at all different times of day. You might not be able to do that, but um, I'm gonna open these up and then I'll bring you all back in about 10 minutes. So we can do a quick uh, wrap up and um, thank you. But again, I wanna thank you all so much 